Good morning, everybody. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'd like to ask the folks near the back to please close the doors so we have a little more of a reverent atmosphere here as we're going to begin our church program very shortly. I am so happy to see such a full congregation. This is a, a real treat. Every year I come back and every year I wonder, is it going to be a large turnout or a medium turnout? Praise the Lord. We have a real good turnout this year. Thank you for coming. It's a, there's a lot of work and a lot of effort that's put into these programs. And the more that come and enjoy that blessing, the better. So thanks for making that possible. I'm doing some pictures because uh, later on I'm going to be putting stuff on Facebook. And uh, you might see your face there, if possible. Now, last night we had our, uh, we, first of all, yesterday afternoon, we had a treat. We had uh, the afternoon activities. We had about 40 to 50 people go down to McKenzie Childs. Great tour. We had the campus tour, about 10 people for that. We had people doing their own activities on the sidelines, which we welcome too, of course. We got to meet a lot of students here at church, at the cafeteria, and about the campus. Um, we um, had a wonderful Vesper program last evening. If you missed that, you missed a treat. And now today we've got a bunch of more action-packed adventures ready for you. So uh, stay tuned, fasten your seatbelt, and enjoy the ride. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention this morning in our welcome is that um, we really want to encourage every one of you to make sure you register. If you registered the other years, you might think, well, I've done it before, they don't need it again. We might need your renewed address. We might not have the right email address or phone number. We want to know who's here. We want a head count. So please take the time to quickly register in the front if you haven't done so yet. Um, very important. We have a lot of activities that we plan and things throughout the year. The Academy does. And we want you to be on the inside no list. We want you to get these announcements. It's very important. You don't want to miss out on some of the treats happening here. Get your contact information in on the registration and you'll be kept up to date on things that are happening here. Lord's active on this campus, friends. Praise the Lord. Amen. We have a living legacy. As I mentioned last night, I went to PVA my freshman year and it closed. Then I came out here the next three years. And as sad as that was to lose PVA, I am so happy to have my newfound Union Springs family. And when we have our PVA alumni weekends every four years, we gather at places like Atlantic Union College campus or Camp Winnipeg. But when I come to Union Springs alumni weekend, I come home. Praise the Lord. We have a living legacy here at Union Springs Academy. And by your efforts and your donations and your prayers and God's grace and the dedicated commitment of the faculty and staff and the membership of the New York Conference, this living legacy with its wonderful Christian education mission continues today. Praise the Lord. I want to introduce to you the fellow at the helm, the new principal at Union Springs Academy. He has really been a dynamic uh, improvement here on campus, Mr. Todd Coulter, and I want to give him a few moments to welcome you as well. Thank you, Thank you John. Well, welcome. And what John said is true. Welcome home. You are home. I hope it feels like home. As I was sharing with the students uh, on Friday, I was just letting them know that, you know, when alumni happens, they pretty much take over the weekend, they take over the campus because it is theirs, and it's time to share this week with you guys. And so we're so glad to have so many here. This is my first um, Union Springs Academy alumni, and um, so it's all new experiences for me, but it is so wonderful to see our church just packed with, with, um, with you. Some, of, some have come up and asked me, you know, hey, how can we help um, Union Springs Academy. What, what can we do? What can I do? And um, of course, I'm going to share right then, but I also just want to invite you to come out at 3 o'clock um, in the gymnasium. Um, I'm going to kind of share some of those things that are going on that where you can help. And, and I'll kind of give a little bit of a teaser just because in, in case someone misses and isn't able to show up, you all should have a little um, blue paper in your program that, that mentions the, the Union Springs Academy Campus Renovation Week. This was planned with brainchild from alumni, and it is an incredible thing. It's only happened once before. We're in the second year of it, 
And we're taking a whole week having all kinds of volunteers come in and make all kinds of changes. People give money, people give service, all different ways. And I want to invite you to sign up and to register and to come out. You know, it, you really can't outgive God. And I guarantee that if you decide to be a part of our renovation week, you will be more blessed than you realize. And, um, you know, so I just want to invite um, you to, to put that on in your schedules and see if you can come out and be a support. And at 3 o'clock this, this afternoon, I'd love to invite you to come in here and just kind of see what, can, what you can do to be a part of Union Springs Academy still. Um, and I also want to invite you to the lunch. Um, Union Springs Academy is very thankful for you. And we would like to provide lunch for you up in the gym today. Um, so if you, after, after church service, please head on up and, and, and join us. Thank you again for being such a strong alumni. Thank you, Principal Coulter. We appreciate your hospitality here to come back home. As Principal uh, Coulter mentioned, the renovation week last year was a raving success. We raised about fifty-four dollars to $58,000, and, and which was part of that was a matching $25,000 grant by a benevolent um, anonymous alumnus. And uh, we had, uh, what was it, 100 and some odd volunteers that came here? And it was a hands-on mission project. I know the class of 85 set the trend with uh, Maranatha Project vacations. It was a Maranatha Project at Union Springs is what it essentially turned out to be. And it helped with over $100,000 between funds raised, volunteer labor, volunteer materials, made a huge impact on campus. And we're going to do that again this year with your help and support and your prayers. Thank you. Um, I also want to spend just a short time here, too, with our president of the New York Conference, Elder Zapala. He's here with us this morning. He'd like to also greet you. Thank you, John. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Well, this is, uh, I was debating outside there with someone. I say, I am supposed to be an alumni now. I say, what makes you an alumni of this school? And I say, well, uh, been here, right? <laughs> well, uh, not quite, but we can still look forward to uh, going back to uh, uh, high school and being under Todd teaching, right? I want to thank you all for uh, being what you are for the school. Someone I remember when I was in college asked a question, what is the best asset of uh, educational institution and we were all sitting there thinking about money, buildings, um, what else, many other things that we could, pro perhaps the staff and someone from the way back shouted the alumni and I haven't forgot that because that was done in a week of prayer in my college and I reflect about this one of the things that keeps this school here driven is the alumni. We have seen the statistic of how in North America division, we are closing, we have closed in the last 10 years, 270 school. That is an alarming number. But I will tell you, when you look what happened to many of those school is that they lost contact with their alumni. They were not present, they were not there. And we want to thank you for being present, for being active, for doing whatever it takes, not just to register, but to be actively involved in the life of the school. And I am so happy to be a part of the school at this time, at this moment, at this present age, with Todd being uh, principal, will you just come and stand here beside me? Because I will tell you one thing. Todd has really bring a taste and flavor to the school that we are all excited about. Amen. And I want to publicly here th thank you for what you have brought to the school. Thank you so much. Very good. You know, it's, it's our school and this is where our kids will be in. And this is where your kids, your grandchildren will be coming. Talking about all of this, we want to put an emphasis for the next upcoming years on enrollment. 
If you think about having more of you there, the only way to multiply that is by increasing enrollment. So we will have more alumni in the years to come. I want to make an introduction here, which is somewhat uncommon to this weekend. But because you are here and you will get to know, I just want to make this introduction. Uh, recently, the Conference Executive Committee has met and analyzed the various ways of ministry that we are carrying in the conference. And we decided that we needed a greater emphasis on youth ministry, a greater emphasis on working on our young people. And that's why we came up and we decided to not only put our words and our mouth into this, but also our pockets, finances, and investing into this. And by doing so, also creating a sense of collaboration between the youth and education department. So we have also decided to uh, appoint a new superintendent of education and the person of Jeremy Garlock. Will you stand, Jeremy, and come over here, please? Thank you. Jeremy is our new superintendent of education. We, uh, we like, I hear somebody clapping. <laughs> The superintendent of education uh, has a very clear cut uh, job description, and I believe Jeremy is capable of carrying that uh, to the fullness. Also, he will be associate youth director, working in collaboration with our youth director, uh, Pastor Dan Whittle. Will you stand, Dan, for those who haven't seen you this year? Very good. Thank you so much. We have we have a team. We have a team in our conference. We are here to work. We are here to do what needs to be done. And you will get, you're going to see us on the street, but it's, it's fixing the road. That's what we're going to be doing. So thank you, Jeremy. We also want to say thank you to Elder Bradley Booth. He took a call uh, about a couple of weeks ago to the Minnesota conference. I am not sure exactly all the detail of his call, but I'm sure that with time, you will get to know some of that. So we want to say thank you to him as well for his service to the New York Conference. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the time while you're here. And I want to see tomorrow the girls' soccer game. God bless you. If there are any children ages 5 to 10, we are about to start Children's Church downstairs. So you can follow me out, and we'll go downstairs and have a good time. Thank you, Elder Zavala. Um, I want to emphasize for, for you real quickly, look around. This is the heart of New York Conference. This is your, your largest mission field right here, Union Springs Academy. We have camp meeting over here every year. The New York Conference started over here before it moved to Syracuse. This mission field has great potential. We appreciate your investment and value of our program here in Christian education and the youth of this conference. Thank you for sharing that with us today. Uh, this time I want to invite our um, executive secretary and membership secretaries to come forward. We're going to have our annual class roll call. So you'll get to see who among your classmates has come to Union Springs Academy this year for Alumni Weekend. Hello. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thank you, John, for the introduction and for all the information. He's uh, been a wonderful president and he's a wonderful historian and I appreciate all the things that he's learned. Um, I love Alumni Weekend and this year has been a special year because I have connected and met faces that I haven't seen in years from my childhood as a toddler all the way up until uh, my son's some of my sons and the older kids from Camp Cherokee and stuff. So it's just been wonderful to reconnect. And I just want to encourage you again to please stop by and see us. And look through your brochure. There's lots of mistakes. We're human. The computer's not right. I want to um, know of any updates or anyone that's missing or any wrong information so we can make it right for next time. We want to try to better ourselves. This year, we're going to do a little bit something as a membership and as a roll call. Um, because every year we have another year added, it gets longer and longer and longer. So we're going to try to shorten it. 
a little bit by grouping the non-honor years together like for in decades. Another thing different that we're doing is we're also going by five year. This is a new thing and that we're starting, but we're gonna start doing it every five years. And the reason for that is after my 30th anniversary, and others have mentioned it, and you really realize life and appreciate life, and you never know from one minute to the next when your time is up. And as you get older, sometimes you can't wait 10 years to meet with your classmates again. So we're trying to incorporate the five-year class too and trying to encourage people to come every five years. Also, um, one thing that used to take a lot of time was when we would mention our um, family, our classmates that have passed away. Um, we used to have a separate thing for that, and then we started last year by incorporating it into our roll call. Um, I'm only going to do a few this year because I was very lax in collecting that information and keeping track of it. So there's a lot of deaths that I don't remember. And so in all fairness, I will do that next year. And that's why I need you to stop by and see me and, and update those so we can do it next year. The only deaths that I'm going to mention this year are two faculty members. Um, Grant Pearson, who was a business manager and a dean in the 60s and the 70s, uh, early 70s, passed away this last year. And then he, there was also Oris Roshak, who was a math teacher for many, many years. In all, he served approximately 18 to 20 years as a faculty staff. And two years ago, he made his last appearance as alumni staff, and we were happy to have him return and be happy. And the um, conference room in the ad building has been dedicated and honored in his name, and their plaque is back up regarding his name. So unfortunately, we've lost those. At this time to start our roll call, I would like anyone who is a task force worker, um, any uh, previous faculty and the current faculty, if you would all stand, please. <laughs> I'm already standing. Terry's one here. <laughs> and I would just like to take this time to thank you for your dedication and your sacrifice that you've made to help our children and us to learn about God. We're going to start off with the years 2006 to 2014. Our honor years will be at the end. So those who attended 2006 through 2014, if you could please stand. Years 2001 to 2004, please stand. Those attended 1996 in 19, through 1999, please stand. Years 1991 to 1994. 1981 through 1984, Ooh. please stand. <laughs> I even make mistakes there. Um, years 1976 through 1979, please stand. Years 1971 through 1974, please stand. Nineteen sixty six through nineteen sixty nine to nineteen fifty nine. 
1951 through 1954. Nineteen forty six through nineteen forty nine. Nineteen forty one through nineteen forty four. Nineteen thirty six to nineteen thirty nine. 1933 through 1934. Our oldest alumni um, a couple years ago was from 1933 and 1934, and I just unfortunately remember her last name is UC. Um, I need to learn and find out the status and find out who was our, still our oldest member. It would be great if she was still the one. Our honor years, and again, we're going to go every five years, is something new. Um, so if you can pass the word on to other classmates in other years. Our first year uh, is the five-year 2010. Stand, please. Already standing. <laughs> Ten-year 2005. Fifteen-year 2000. 20 year, 1995. <laughs> 25 years, 1990. Our 30 years, 1985. Our 35 years, 1980. 40 year, 1975. 45 year, 1970. Fifty year, nineteen sixty five. Fifty five years, nineteen sixty. Is there anybody? <laughs> okay, fifty years, nineteen sixty five. I mean, 50, 55 years, 1965. Three years ago on Alumni Weekend, 2012, I appeared in front of you and asked for special prayer for my brother. Bud Schirmerhorn. Bud was the vice president of the class of 55 and also the first president of the Alumni Association. He had, <laughs> <laughs> one week prior to Alumni Weekend in 2012, while he was on a mission trip to uh, Holbrook, Mission School in Arizona. He had fallen off a roof and got seriously injured. He broke his neck and several ribs and I think his back, I can't remember all the details. He was in the hospital of course and that had happened one week earlier. It seemed to be progressing quite well right during church service on alumni weekend. 
I got the word that he had taken a turn for the worse. And he ended up, he was on a ventilator for, I think, close to two weeks. And I asked for special prayer. It was touch and go for quite a while. But then he started improving. It was a slow recovery. But by fall that year, he had recovered quite well. And he says that the only permanent uh, problem he has he doesn't have any back pain, which you might expect from such an injury, but he's two inches shorter. <laughs> now, I'd like to suggest if Abraham Lincoln grew two inches taller, who would notice it? When my brother's two inches shorter, who'd notice it? <laughs> but anyhow, I want to thank you for the, your prayers, and I want to thank God for the recovery of my brother. Bud, will you please stand? There he is. <laughs> 50 year, 1965. Please stand. We did. We did. Okay. Okay. Short memory, short person. What can I say? <laughs> the 60 year class, 1955. I did that too. <laughs> what was the last year we did? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> See, I'm human. 65 years, 1950. <laughs> 70 years, 19. 1945. 75 years, 1940. Um, I want to make a, a comment here that there was one person that she wanted to be uh, send her well wishes. It's uh, Lillian. Her last name is now Thomas. <laughs> I forgot her other name, but she wanted to come for her 40 years. So, anyway. Um, 80 years, 1935. Anybody here? Okay. Again, thank you for coming. Thank you if you've registered already. Again, I just want to encourage you to look at your bulletin, and if you notice anything that's wrong and needs correcting, please come see me, and we'll try to get it corrected. And I really hope you have a wonderful weekend. Happy Sabbath, everyone, and welcome Amen. home. Before you go, Thank you. <laughs> um, we were just reminded, um, any of our current or past people and um, alumni, if you have served in any kind of a military service, if you would please stand. We thank you from the deep part of our hearts for your service in protecting our, our, our uh, country. I also would like to have you uh, come and so we can note that in our books that you served in the service and what part and what years. Thank you again.
Would you all stand for prayer? Dear Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for bringing us all together here this beautiful Sabbath day to worship you and to praise you. I want to thank you for bringing many of us back to this campus and where we um, had wonderful teachers and staff to guide us. And um, I'd like to thank you for the friends that we made here on campus, friends that have, through the years, been there with us when the good times happened, when we were able to um, rejoice together and laugh together, and friends that sometimes were with us through the rough times in our lives, the rough spots, and they would cry with us, and they would comfort us. Um, I'd like to um, ask you to prepare our hearts for the message that Delbert is to bring us. Give him the words that you would have us hear, Lord. And most of all, I want to ask that you will come soon. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. I guess you can remain for song. Please open your hymnals to number 499. We'll sing together our opening hymn. seated. 
I'll ask the deacons to come forward for the offering. An alumni weekend is one milestone during which we look back at the path we've traveled in life and reflect on how God has brought us through the years. Well, today's offering will directly benefit our students here at Union Springs Academy through student aid. More importantly, this offering can be viewed as a thank offering for God's direction in and blessings on our lives so far. The class of 2015 has picked Jeremiah 2911 as their class verse. It reads, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I'm confident by the simple fact that you are sitting here today that you believe that God planned for you to attend Union Springs Academy because your time here was part of his amazing plan for your life. Maybe it wasn't your plan to come to the academy, but he blessed you with good things while you were here, whether it was the development of strong friendships that have survived through the years, uh, whether it was the lessons that you learned in and out of the classroom that led you to success in your life's work, or, and a growing devotion to him. Today, I urge you to give generously to assist our students and with overflowing gratitude for God's leading in your life. If you'll bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we bring to you with our gratitude offerings that might seem meager to us when compared to what you've given to us, but we give them to you. We know that you can empower and multiply and use them for your glory. So accept our offerings. We thank you for this Sabbath, this chance to um, visit with one another, fellowship with you, and it's a reminder of what we will experience when we reach heaven. In your name we pray, amen. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing and obey the Spirit of the Lord. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. Switch on it. It's on. Ooh, talk about nerves. We haven't done this in quite some time, and we hope it's all a blessing for you. Jesus loves me. Jesus. 
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. Happy it's Sabbath. good that we are here today and receiving a blessing. I know that some of us, maybe this is our first time back, or maybe we come every year, but we want everyone to have a blessing. Much power, much prayer. Little prayer, little power. So we want to take our prayers to Jesus. So if you bow your heads with me. Thank you. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the blessings you've given us this weekend to renew friendships, to meet our fellow classmates. 50 years is a long time, but you're grateful. To, we're grateful to you for all you've given us. We thank you for Union Springs Academy 
and Christian education. We want to support Christian education so we can learn about Jesus and our children can learn about Jesus and our grandchildren can learn about Jesus. Lord, keep us faithful till you come. Help us not to lose our faith, but stand by Jesus. Bless our speaker this morning, Delbert Gilman. Thank you that our class could be here and renew our friendships. Bless us now and send the Holy Spirit that we all will receive a blessing. And thank you in Jesus' name, amen. morning. Our speaker this morning would like us to take a text from the book of Daniel. So if you would open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1, and it's verse 8. And I'm going to be reading this text this morning from the New Living Translation. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable things. May God's word speak to our hearts at this time. When I was chatting with Delbert a few days ago, I told him I really needed some things biographically to share with you, and if he wanted it to ni be nice, he better give me something good. We'll see how it goes. Uh, if you look on your program, on the back of it, there's a great picture, and it gives some excellent information about Delbert, but it certainly does not give you information about the real Delbert. Like the majority of our class, he is retired. And like the majority of our class, he chose to go back to work. He is the manager of a retirement rehab type facility, and he enjoys being there around those elderly, elderly folks because it makes him feel a bit younger. You know, canes, crutches, walkers, wheelchairs. The uh, thing is, he had a recent knee replacement. He doesn't like to admit that, OK? Then there's the prankster in Delbert that cannot be properly present, be presented in a little brief biography, but if you talk to Delbert and you look him in the eye, you'll see that little sparkle that says, I'm going to find a way to get you off guard. And then there's the laugh. Enough said. <laughs> it took Delbert longer than some of us to decide what he wanted to do with his life after we all left our home here. So during that time, Delbert honorably served our country in the military when it was not a popular thing to do, and our servicemen were totally disrespected. But that didn't hold Delbert back one bit. He came home, he went to AUC, he finished his education, he met this sweet little young girl, Karen. I'm not sure why she said yes, but she did. Fifty years ago, we marched to pomp and circumstance, and I don't think any one of us imagined that we would be standing here 50 years later. Yes, we're older, we're grayer, some of us have less hair, some of us no longer resemble the teenagers that we were, and some of us have been laid to rest. But we are still family. We laugh together, we cry together, we protect each other, and we surprise each other. When we get together, we literally begin where we left off yesterday. So when I speak for the entire class, I say it with great pleasure. I introduce to you today our brother and our friend, Delbert.
got to make some room here. I don't know whose Bible this is, but I'm just going to set it over there. You can claim it after. Thank you so much, Judy, for this honor. You asked me a couple of months ago, Judy called me. She says, Delbert, we don't have a speaker for our class. Would you do that? And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it, and she was getting anxious. I've got to have an answer, and would text me and Facebook me, and finally I said, you know, I, I will. And I'll tell you what, um, I really didn't have any idea how moving this is going to be for me today. Uh, Wayne... And Colleen, I just want to say thank you for that beautiful, beautiful song. <clears throat> I'm going to try to keep my emotions in check here. You know, the whole essence of righteousness by faith is wrapped up in Jesus loves me. This I know. Amen. That says it all. We could, we, could, we could quit church right now. That song was beautiful. Thank you so much. You know, uh, young people back here, and I'm, you know, I'm from Oklahoma. You know, I live in Oklahoma now for 33 years, and I'm not used to having anybody behind me, you know, old gunslingers and stuff. You know, you don't want anybody behind you. But, uh, you know, I'm going to have to deal with that, I guess. I guess it makes me nervous. You know? <laughs> you know, you don't know who you've done wrong, and they're gunning for you. But uh, anyway, you'll, you'll keep them away? Good, thank you. <laughs> But um, it's, it's really until kids, young people, I don't want to call you kids, young people, uh, until you've been away from some place and there's some people that you haven't seen for 50 years, you can't imagine what it's like to be reunited with people. Um, just a little short thing here, and I know we've taken a long time in our preliminaries, and rightfully so, and Judy told me I had two hours, so just, uh, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll try to keep it a bit under that, okay, but uh, I have something to say today, and I'm probably going to say it. And, um, and so, uh, anyway, just, you know, when you get 60-something eh, years old, you know, <laughs> It's, it's easy to uh, get distracted from what you were talking about, but Judy and uh, getting together with these folks and coming back here in the flood of memories, we used to mow this field here where this church sits now. Henry Foote and I would be out here and then bailing the hay and then picking up the hay and taking it up to the barn up there. And so many floods of memories, and we've sat around yesterday and talked and Ted Peckham and I uh, shared a room at the hotel, and we sat up until 1 o'clock this morning talking, and finally I said, you know what, i gotta, I got to have my head halfway screwed on in the morning like this, so I guess we'd better go to bed. But anyway, we could have talked forever. And that's the beautiful thing about old friends. When you have real friends, you may not see each other for many years, but you can just sit down and start talking like it was just yesterday. And, uh, and you pick up right where you left off. Al Battistone, can't believe. In November, it'd be 50 years since I'd seen Al at AUC. And we had an experience together. I won't even go into that, but uh, all these life-changing experiences. But really what I want to talk to you about today, and I'm used to having a lapel on because I like to wander around when I'm talking, so I guess I'll just have to fidget behind the desk here. But... Uh, <laughs> Really what I want to talk about today uh, in our, our scripture reading is about Daniel, about really what's in a name. When somebody says a name, what kind of an image flashes in your mind? Now, uh, we mentioned some people here. Uh, if you talk about, um, I don't know, somebody famous, somebody you worked with, an image comes into your mind. A name, and young people, I want you to understand, your name is your reputation. 
my friends here, we're here talking like this, and Judy made some remarks about being a prankster and so on like this. But so when my name comes up to my friends, I can only imagine the thoughts that go through their mind. <laughs> you know, it, I'm sure it's a wide range of things, okay? Some good, probably not, some not so good. But whatever, your name is your reputation. And <clears throat> illustrate that, and, and, and why I'm saying that is so important for you to protect your name and how people think about you because, uh, for instance, she mentioned, I'm a nursing home administrator and uh, I never did retire, I'm still, I got married late, I have a daughter that's still in college and so I've gotta get her through, I got her brother through and, and my wife and I uh, still have to get our daughter through so we're, gonna, we're going to do that. So I continue to work and I enjoy what I do so if you like what you do, you don't work a day in your life, you know? And so, uh, but anyway, uh, as an employer, uh, so many times uh, I would uh, have to counsel people, let's shall we say. Uh, you like to praise people when you can, and occasionally you have to address people when they're not doing things right. And they, some people would come in and they'd have an attitude about, well, I don't care, you know, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. And I said, really? You seriously mean that? If you really do, you're a foolish person. If you don't care what anybody thinks about you, because your name follows you around. As an example, I uh, had an admissions director at the facility I was at for 14 years in Oklahoma City. And uh, I had to replace this admissions director. And so I, I spent a couple of weeks, uh, we'd advertise, and I got 26 applications to look at. And I was going through them, trying to weed out the ones that I thought were going to be the best candidates. And, and so I was having my HR person call people and set up appointments for interviews and so on. And, um, and then they came in with one, said, well, okay, we got this one and it came kind of late. Like that. So I said, okay, let me look at it. And so I looked at it and the name was Nancy Wance. Now, when I'd been in Norman, Oklahoma, which is the southern part of Oklahoma City, a suburb, the University of Oklahoma is there, this gal had worked for me as a social services director at that facility. And as soon as I saw her name, I said, okay, cancel the appointments, okay? There may be a superstar in there somewhere, but cancel the appointments because I'm gonna hire her. Now, why would I do that? I knew her. I knew what she was like. She was a wonderful Christian Baptist woman. Uh, she was a hard worker, a very intelligent person, a very ethical person. And so I knew what I had. And I said, cancel the rest of them. Tell her to come and see me. And I hired her. Because I knew who she was. I knew what she was like. So folks, Young people, you keep that in your mind as you go out there and you start making your way in life, as you graduate from school and you move on, keep that in mind that your reputation, your name is you. That's what follows you around. We're talking about a good friend of ours that's not here today. He was killed in Vietnam, Forrest Ward. I want to tell you a short little story about Forrest that nobody else knows. I had come back from the Army myself, 1969, I went back to AUC and um, started over again as a freshman. And uh, I met a guy there, uh, an African-American fellow named Joe Jackson. Don, you may remember Joe Jackson. And um, <clears throat> we got in a conversation and we got talking about Forrest and I was telling him and relating how bad I felt that Forrest had been killed in Vietnam. He says, let me tell you about Forrest. He says, this is my memory of Forrest. He said, it was, we, we had a holiday weekend. I don't remember, this is 40 some years ago, he told me this, I don't remember what weekend. It might've been Thanksgiving or something, but all I know was that Forrest, and Joe was out there working on his car. The rear end had gone out on his car and it was pouring rain. All of his friends, nobody wanted to help him. They were leaving to go home for the weekend for a long weekend. 
And behind Lenham Hall at AUC, if you've ever been there, the ground kind of pitches down, the parking lot pitches down to the back. And the rain, rain was just cascading down the parking lot and he was laying on the ground under his car trying to work on his car. Forrest came pulling in. He had worked at Van Brody's in, in Clinton all night long. And he came in and he stopped by and he saw Joe working on his car and he said, well, what's the problem, man? He said, well, the rear end's out on this thing and I've got to change it and, I, and, I, and it's difficult doing it by myself. Forrest said, just let me put my stuff up in the room. I'll be right down. Three hours laying down there and the water cascading down and you're laying down and it, your body forms a dam. They were soaking wet. But Forrest was going to go home that weekend too to, to Bennington. But Forrest laid there in the water with this guy. That's the kind of guy Forrest was. That's the kind of guy Forrest was. He laid there and they fixed the car so he could go home to Connecticut. Unfortunately, Joe Jackson was killed in a bad car accident several years later. But I never forgot that story about Forrest. Our name means something. A memory in Joe Jackson's mind was of a, of a guy who sacrificed his time. It wasn't convenient to lay in the water and get soaking wet out there working under somebody else's car, but that's what, that's, what, that's what he did. I want to talk about somebody else that's an outstanding character, too. She read here in Daniel, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Daniel, the first chapter. And in the, in the King James Version here, it says, now, it says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Now, what I'm talking about today is not just food, because first of all, we have two couple of strong passions in our lives, and food is one of them. And if you're in control of your appetite, then you're probably going to be in control of the rest of your life as well, if you can discipline yourself on that. But Daniel, Daniel had a name. And first of all, why would Daniel even have the audacity? Do you know what? Do you know the story? Everybody know the story, young people? I don't know what they teach in school anymore these days. You never know. But, uh, and I'm sure here at Union Springs Academy, they're, they're teaching you Bible, and we know the story of Daniel. But think about this. Daniel asked the prince of the eunuchs to let them change his diet. And I think because of Daniel, and, and, and this is the thing, is be a leader, don't be a follower. Because Daniel stood up, we know about three other people too, don't we? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But those, those are the only people you know about here, because Daniel stood up. And Daniel had the courage to say, no, I don't want to be like everybody else. I was raised a certain way. I have principles. There's things I believe in. I'm not going to compromise my principles. And by the way, how old was Daniel? I figure he's a teenager, about 17 years old. Okay? So it's, here's Daniel. And he stands up and he says, and so, and you read on here. It says, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Well, you know, for those of you who may not be involved with Bible study or anything, Nebuchadnezzar had come over from Babylon and taken the city of Jerusalem, and they took 10,000 people back to Babylon with them. Now, if you go in a line, if you had a map back here, Jerusalem, Babylon, kind of in a straight line, about 500 miles. But you don't go that way. It's inhospitable territory. It's about 1,000 miles up around what they call the Fertile Crescent. And so they walked. They didn't put them in the back of the bus or anything like that. They were walking. 10,000 prisoners. And so if we read on the story here, and Daniel and his friends, they did. Uh, uh, Daniel, I think, probably developed a relationship with this person as they walked along. And this eunuch realized that Daniel was a special person. Daniel was a man of integrity, a man of principle. And so he says, and the prince of the eunuch said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should you see your fa he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. 
Now you're talking about kings have life or death control over people. And the eunuch had a very big concern. If I don't take care of these people he's putting me in charge of, on a whim he could say just take him out and let's take his head. And so it was a very real concern. And so Daniel built this reputation because of the, of, of the character that this eunuch could see in Daniel. What I want to do is turn over now to chapter 6 in Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar had taken Jerusalem, and they'd been in captivity now for quite a few years. And, uh, you know, the, the, they, were, they were there for 70 years, but the 70 years aren't up yet. And, but Babylon has fallen. Darius came in, and I'm saying, some people say Dar Darius some people say Darius. Well, I'm the speaker, so I get to say Darius. I'll, I'll say it the way I want. <laughs> okay? But anyways, Darius had taken Jerusalem. They diverted the Euphrates River. They marched in under the, under the gates, and they took the city that night of Belshazzar's feast. And what's amazing here is that when an empire takes over, usually anybody that's of any prominence that could potentially be a threat for a coup or something like this. Usually they took him out back and that was that. But Daniel, because of the type of a man that he was, his faithfulness to God, transferred from one empire to another to a very high position. So we start off here in Daniel 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them and the king should have no damage. Well, you know, look at our political system today. Yeah, there's, there's corruption, there's people that, that, you know, embezzlement, graft. Those things happen in society. And so the king's trying to protect himself that the finances and all the things came into the coffers of the king and that there's people not pilfering stuff on the side. And so these people are set over them. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Now what's even more amazing is when you've got to realize Daniel is a slave. He's a captive. And he's risen to the highest position next to the very king himself in this empire because of his integrity, because of his character. You can't emphasize this enough, young people. You, one person, can make a difference. You can make a difference. You say, well, I'm just one person. By standing for what you believe, being uncompromising in what you believe, can make a difference. Daniel is a sterling example of that. And let's read on here. Daniel's been put over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. They got the CIA, they got the FBI, they went out there and they did a background check on Daniel. They're trying to find something wrong that they can get rid of this because jealousy, envy, and maybe he was keeping them because of his honesty and integrity for, from getting a little stuff going on the side like this. But Daniel, they, they want to get rid of him. So we read on here. They can't find anything wrong with him. His character is impeccable. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statue and make a, a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. You know, this is one of the amazing things when you look at it and you think back at, at various individuals in the Bible. I mean... John the Baptist lost his head because of a king making a comment and then having too much pride to back up on it. Well, King Darius 
they're playing to his vanity. Let's play to their ego. Okay, so that, these guys are smart. They're playing to his ego. And so he said they want him to establish thing, this thing. He says, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius, sign the writing and the decree. He didn't realize the trap that was being set for him. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Now this wasn't an occasional thing with Daniel. If you want to know why Daniel had such strength of character, why Daniel uh, was such an outstanding individual, here's a key. As he did aforetime, this was a habit Daniel had. Daniel spent much time in prayer. Somebody was up here earlier and said, I forget which one it was. It might have been you, Robert. I don't know. Much prayer, much power, little prayer, little power. If you spend a lot of time in prayer, if you want a really close relationship with Jesus Christ, spend a lot of time on your knees and talk to him like your best friend. Dwight Nelson coined the phrase, you know, your forever friend. I suppose he's the one, he's the one I heard it from when they were doing the net series back in the 90s. But your forever friend, Jesus. Daniel had that relationship with him. In fact, let's, let's turn over here and just take a little interruption here. There's no charge for this. You don't have to collect the plate. There's no honorarium necessary like this. This is a freebie. Let's turn over here to chapter 9. And let's go to verse 23. Daniel has been in prayer. And you ought to read chapter 9 if you never have. What a beautiful prayer Daniel prayed for his people. And he included himself in that prayer. He didn't hold himself up as better than the people who were in captivity in Babylon, or now Medo-Persia. But Daniel's in prayer, and he's been given a vision, and, and he's praying. But let's read verse 23 here. At the beginning of thy supplications, now let's back up one ac actually here, uh, Gabriel, Verse 21, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Don't you want that said about you in heaven? In heaven, there's conversation that happens, and Daniel is greatly beloved. Why is he so beloved? Can you be greatly beloved? Huh? Can you be greatly beloved? He's greatly beloved because of his integrity, his character, his fidelity to God. Daniel is greatly beloved. What a wonderful thing to have to say about you in heavenly courts. Greatly beloved. Verse 10 here and back in chapter 6. Now Daniel, let's go back to 11 then. So then. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree? that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days of save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. And I'm sure they said it with such purity of heart and such great concern for the law that had been passed. You know, they want to uphold the law, right? Yeah. And so the king is sucked right into this. Oh, yes. It says, the king answered and said, the thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. And he's playing right into this. He doesn't know how he's being set up. Then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, which is of the children of captivity of Judah, regardeth thee not. O king, nor the decrees that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased. 
This is a king who has, I don't know how long he's known Daniel. I don't think that they had overthrown Babylon that long at this point. But he, this is a man who admires Daniel. And he says he's sore displeased. You might say he's really hacked. He's very, very upset because he realizes in an instant what exactly has happened here. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. This is one of the things in our title here. I said, Daniel, a little bit of a different twist. I've never heard anybody preach or talk about Darius and his faith. Let's read on. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, No, O king. And I mean, they're reminding him, yeah, very officiously and, and with great concern, I'm sure. No, O king, you know, that the law of the Medes and Persians can't be altered, you know, uh, that, is, that no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. You think about the faith of this. This is, this is, a, this is a pagan king, but because of his association with Daniel and seeing Daniel's integrity and how he's lived his life in his past and his reputation followed him from Babylon, okay? He comes over there and he says to Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king asked, sealed it with his mouth, with his own signet, and with the signet of the Lord's, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. He's upset. He can't go to sleep. I don't know what he was doing, but he was very, very upset. But then the next morning, and when, then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. Now, I want you to think about that too. I don't know if you've ever contemplated this or not. You may have. But it's kind of amazing to me, all through time up to that point, anybody who had ever been thrown into the lion's den, was there any reason to go back in the morning and look for them? I mean, get real. Had it ever happened before? No. But this king, because of Daniel's witness, had faith. If there's anybody alive that would be still alive in the morning, it would be Daniel. Because I've never met a more upright person in my entire life. That's why he went back. That's why he would even bother to go back and look for Daniel. Yeah, I lost my place here. No, he, okay, verse 19. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the king, den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God in whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me, forasmuch as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then the king, now you could read really like this. Then the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded they should be take Daniel up. You think so? Then the king was exceedingly glad for him. This guy's doing backflips. Are you kidding me? He is so happy. And commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. And no manner of hurt was found upon him. Because he believed 
in his God. Now, now, let's see what happens next. You have duped the king. And I got to tell you right now, that's not a good thing to do. Because let's read on. Then, uh, and the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, and their wives, and the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces, or they ever came at the bottom of the den. They snatched them out of the air before they ever touched the ground. The men, their wives, and their children. You don't mess with a king. Now, then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that, that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. What an amazing story, isn't it? Because one man had unswerving loyalty to God, would not compromise his beliefs in the slightest way. Despite a decree that went out, he still followed his practice and went home and prayed. He wasn't going to change. Folks, Jesus is coming soon. I believe that firmly. There's so many signs in our world, and we look at Bible prophecy, unbelievable. You know what? If you're not living your life in such a way right now that you can cling to God's promises, or if you think that you can procrastinate till the last moment, you won't have the courage. You won't have the habit of doing things right, no matter how small it might seem. We don't want to be on the wrong side of salvation. When I asked Judy, Judy, I said, Judy, what, what's the theme of our talk this weekend? And she says, anew. And I wanted to clarify her with her exactly as I texted her back. I said, what do you mean anew? Well, begin anew, whatever. That's what I thought she was talking about. You know what? We have that opportunity to begin anew right now. Now is the day of decision. Not tomorrow. You know what? Our friend Forrest Ward and others, when they were in combat, you don't know, and none of us knows, whether we have tomorrow. We don't know if we have five minutes from now. Now is the time to make a decision. You don't have to be old. Daniel was 17. When he initially, when he, when, when, when he stood up and made the right decision and says, and determined in his mind, I mean, he purposed in his mind, he made up his mind, I'm going to live the way I know I should live, the way I was taught by my parents, I will not compromise my beliefs. You say, but I'm old. It's hard for me to change or to go do something useful for the Lord. Let me tell you something. My father-in-law will be 93 in September. And faithfully, every week, when you go to church, he goes to the conference offices right next door to the church. There's, there's an alleyway between. And, and um, he goes over there. They give him, they keep, give him his key because he was, he was a pastor there and then a, then a trust services officer for, for many years. But they still give him a key. He's retired now for a period of time. But he goes over and he gets his mail and the Discover Bible courses that are sent in. And I asked him, I said, Al, how many Bible studies have you got going right now? I remind you, he's going to be 93 in September, 17th. He said, 86 Bible studies going. That's what he lives for. 
It's a way of life. That's what he is. Don't think you're beyond doing anything. Well, I'm old now. I'm a little decrepit. My knee bothers me. This hurts. That hurts. We can still do something useful for Jesus. We don't have to just sit back and do nothing because I'm old. If you're a young person, start now. Daniel is one of the outstanding characters in the Bible. And, um, and it's somebody that I greatly admired, one of the stories I love to read about Daniel. And you know, there's a song. And I, this, this is something that kind of gets to me too sometimes. Because, uh, and, and, and ladies and, and men too, some men, but that uh, maybe teach in the children's divisions and they sing the songs. And I've heard them before in my church. I said, well, we need some new songs. You know, wow, we've been singing these songs forever. You know, I'm tired of these old songs. Well, you know what? Those songs are not old to those little kids. And there's a whole lot of sermons in some of those children's songs. And so right now, I would like, Jim, would you come up here and join me? Now, some of you might remember this song, and we're all going to sing it together. Jim got the words. Now, I've got it memorized, but that's okay. But he wasn't sure he remembered all the words to the song, but... We're going to sing this a cappella because I don't know if anybody's got the music right here. But anyway, you remember the song, Dare to Be a Daniel? Amen. We're going to sing that song. Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command, honor them the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Amen. Amen. You know, I don't know when I'm ever going to see any of you folks again. So today, what I would like you to do, you don't have to do this. If you don't mean it, don't do it. But if you want to be like Daniel and purpose in your heart that you're going to follow Jesus Christ, let me, let me give you a little word picture here first. Okay? What do you think heaven's going to be like? You know, I wouldn't want to go to heaven or be that interested either if the picture that's been painted by some people in some churches and so on was as boring as it sounds that you're going to be floating on a cloud strumming on a harp for eternity that's I'll pass on that thank you okay that's but you know what Jesus says in the new earth that we'll be building homes in the country he says the city the new Jerusalem comes down many apartments he says he in his father's house the word is apartments all right and I picture this of my friend Jesus because I'll tell you what I don't know why but he has spared me so many times. It's unbelievable. So many times. I won't take time to even get into it. But I picture myself in a beautiful meadow with flowers like you can't believe. And rolling hills and so gorgeous. And Jesus and I, because eternity is going to be long enough for us to do this. Okay? Sitting on the bank with our feet dangling in the water of a beautiful crystal clear lake. And I'm asking him, what happened here? Why did you save me? And he tells me about times that I'm even totally unaware of when he spared me. He's our forever friend. And if you don't understand that, that Jesus is your friend, he's not looking to get you. He's looking for any inkling of a turning towards him, just like somebody with a newborn baby. You're there carrying your child like this, and some kind of recognition, and they, when the light finally comes on in their eyes, and they, you realize they recognize you as you play with them like this. And here's Jesus looking at us, thinking, 
yeah, this, this got to him a little bit. I see a little bit of turning towards me here like this. Let's fertilize that. Let's pour some water on it. Let's put, pack fertilizer on it and help that to grow some. He's looking for a reason to save us, not to destroy us. So, at this time, if you would like to be like Daniel, if you would like the purpose in your heart, would you stand to your feet right now? Don't do it if you don't mean it, but if you want to follow Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the unbelievable, incredible love that you have for us, Lord, that you came here and died for us, knowing full well that most of us wouldn't even care. And you did it anyway. Lord, we're all sinners, of which I am chief. And Lord, I thank you so much for caring about us, that life is so valuable that you don't want us to throw it away needlessly. I thank you, Lord, for that. And I pray that you would be with Union Springs Academy, a place that gave me an anchor that when I went out into the world for 14 years of stupidity, Lord, that it was something to draw me back. Lord, be with each one of these young people here that they would make right decisions in their lives. And older people here that perhaps have walked away from you, Lord, but need to come back. You want to save us, Lord. What a shame to miss eternity. And the things that you have in store for us, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the mind of man the things that you have in store for us. Lord, we don't want to miss out on that. I pray that your a very special blessing would be on this group today. I pray that a special blessing would be on this school, our alma mater here that we love so much, and that you would bless the staff here and everybody associated with us. But help us to commit our lives to you, Lord. Help us to turn to you before it's too late. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us turn, please, together in our hymnal to hymn number 312 and remain standing for our closing hymn.
Would you bow with me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you this morning and we praise you for this experience today. We thank you for the culmination of another year for the class of 2015. We pray that your blessing will go with them as they go into the world. Stay close to them, give them that Daniel experience. Amen. We praise you, God, for your loving kindness, for your tender mercy. We praise you from whom all blessings flow. We praise you, God, for your omnipotence, your omnipresence, your omniscience. We praise from all creatures here below. We praise God as Trinity. We praise God as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We want to repent this morning, though, because of the things in our lives that have separated us from you. We ask forgiveness for our Laodicean spirit, for our materialism, for our lack of love, mostly. So forgive us, Lord, but revive us to be the Daniels of today and tomorrow. Restore our passion for Jesus and heal our hearts. We ask your blessing upon this special school. We thank you for it. We ask your blessing upon the present administration and staff. Give them courage daily, Lord, and strength. We are standing on hallowed ground. We love the things that we have learned here, the Sabbath, the gospel, the Advent message. We love the history of your people, and we look forward to a bright eternity, O oh Lord, with you. And as we close this service, we covet your blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. And may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. Amen. Amen.